district meeting to order I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll thank you chair fletcher before i call the roll i would like to note for the record that all supervisors are partic are participating via teleconference as such all votes will be handled by a roll call vote with that i will now call the roll supervisor anderson uh here supervisor lawson reamer here supervisor desmond here vice chair vargas Vice Chair Vargas, Chair Fletcher. Fletcher here. Uh, before we get into the agenda, uh, I just want to thank everyone for their thoughts. Uh, around four o'clock this morning, our, our house was engulfed in flames. My family is safe. Uh, we are all 
uh, in a good position. I want to thank in particular the San Diego Police Department, uh, San Diego Fire Department for their very uh, swift response uh, to our home. We're very grateful uh, for their efforts. Uh, and ultimately, at the end of the day, all that matters is your, your family and your loved ones are safe and we're, we're all in a good position. So uh, with that, let's, uh, let's, let's do our work for today. Uh, first on the agenda is non-agendized public communication. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board uh, on matters within our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. The only action we may take is a referral to the chief administrative officer. Reminder, according to Rule 4A, members of the public who are non-English speaking and need interpretation assistance will be allotted extra time. In order to facilitate getting through our agenda pursuant to our rules, uh, we will limit public speakers to the first 10 speakers. If there are additional requests for non-agendized public communication, uh, they will be heard at the conclusion of our agenda item. I'll ask the clerk to call forward our first 10 public speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 13 total requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda. For those that requested to speak, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions provided to you. Again, we will be hearing from the first 10 callers. The remaining callers will be heard at the conclusion of today's session. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I would like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll begin with our first caller. Again, please state your name uh, before beginning your comments. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Barbara Gordon. How we use our land should be a priority for everyone, especially as the board looks to add more marijuana businesses to our community. I'm a public health educator, and my work with young adults has me concerned with the high-potency marijuana products that can contain up to 99% THC. These concentrates are the most popular items sold at our marijuana businesses. But sadly, these products have the most devastating effects on users' mental health. In Colorado, they realized firsthand the devastation of the high-potency THC concentrates had on their young adults' mental health. So Colorado passed a bill capping the percentage of THC concentrates that could be sold. I applaud their efforts to save their young adults' mental health and would encourage the county to do the same. The California Department of Public Health recently indicated the most vulnerable demographics are our 21 to 24-year-olds who are experiencing the sharpest increase of marijuana use. This is an extremely vulnerable time for young adults as they are acquiring the education and skills needed to be successful in life. Again, as the county looks to permit marijuana businesses, I urge the Board of Supervisors to follow Colorado's example and consider capping or regulating the percentage of THC concentrates as part of your marijuana ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, my name is Mike Mayer. I live in Del Mar. On January 20th, NCTD will vote on whether they should ignore the Coastal Commission and the city of Del Mar and take decision-making power over the bluff and beaches of Del Mar by installing an ecologically and geologically destructive fence. We are all concerned about safety. All of the train accidents, which are rare, have occurred between Coast Boulevard South to 13th Street. This area should be the focus of improved safety by installing more signage, track lights that warn of approaching trains, and fencing at track level. There are two bluffs along the Del Mar Coast, a lower bluff at track level and an upper bluff that at the southern border of Del Mar is more than 40 feet above the tracks. Any fencing south of 13th Street just makes no sense. Fencing the upper bluff in residential areas where there is no access to the tracks far below is complete overreach and cannot be justified. In a perfect world, many years ago, NCTD would have forecast the significant increase in rail traffic, looked at the rate of bluff erosion, and moved the tracks off the bluffs by now. There is something NCTD can do now. 
reduce train speed when going through the area where accidents have occurred. The trains reduce speed for curves. Trains should also reduce speed for safety in Del Mar until the tracks can be, removed, can be moved inland. In addition, the upper bluff is sandstone, <coughs> which is fragile and suspect, susceptible to erosion by wind and rain. Drilling 1,500 fence post holes will create 1,500 more opportunities for erosion. If NCTD is allowed to proceed with the fence without co commission of Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next caller. Hi, good morning. This is KB Strange. I'm a pharmacist working in Valley Center. Many of us in the medical field receive a monthly newsletter from Third Hand Smoke Resource Center <clears throat> located at SDSU. This past month, the newsletter reported on a new study from researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, stating that inhaling heated marijuana products produces levels of dangerous particulate matter that are equal to those seen in conventional tobacco cigarettes. Vaping and dabbing uses heat to create an aerosol containing marijuana oils, which the user then inhales. These aerosols contain ultra-fine particles, just like smoke does, and it's these fine particles that can damage lungs and cause heart disease. The researchers reported that vaping or dabbing affect everyone around the user, especially if the vaping or dabbing occurs in an enclosed building, say a marijuana lounge, for example. It's for this reason that American Lung, American Heart, and American Cancer advocate smoke-free public places, smoke-free workplaces, and especially smoke-free enclosed buildings. So let me conclude by asking you that so should our county advocate smoke-free public places so that supervisors can walk the Live Well Talk that you promote to our residents. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Mark Wilcox. I would like to thank Supervisor Desmond for sharing the observation that so many of us residents have regarding deaths from COVID. And that is the role of poor health contributing factors, or comorbidity. As the supervisor mentioned yesterday, the three strongest factors in COVID deaths are hypertension at 58%, obesity at 29%, and diabetes at 21%. I think the suggestion that the county take on their own Live Well Challenge and promote public policies and county education programs that target these three should start immediately. FYI, the number one cause of hypertension is smoking. The county's proposal to decrease smoking rates in the county are admirable. The CDC tells us that 90% of smokers begin before the age of 18. Also today, 1,600 youth in the U.S. will smoke their first cigarette. And today, nearly 200 youth start smoking every day. For so many reasons, the Board of Supervisors needs to revisit their smoking prevention policies and programs. And now is not the time to enable pot shots and their smoking and vaping products to impact youth and the general population. This behavior costs the county more money than any tax revenue that might be collected and creates a horrid health outcome for the smoker and their loved ones. If there was ever a time to follow the science to protect our community and especially our youth. Now is the time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, supervisors. Ann Riddle here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to share with you the LA Times editorial last week regarding pot billboards. It was entitled, 
billboards advertising pot broke Prop 64's promise. And then it admonished, don't go back on the pledge to protect teens. Unfortunately, in the five years since Prop 64 was passed, it has been a nonstop game of putting up billboards. And those proponents of Prop 64 have not met their promises. Predictably, and unfortunately, billboards are everywhere across the state and saturated in the city of San Diego. Finally, a father of two teenagers sued in court and won his case. However, that wasn't the last word. The cannabis industry flexed its slobbing muscle in Sacramento and pushed a bill to unravel that judge's order. Thankfully, Governor Newsom had the good sense to reject that legislation, recognizing, as he said in his message, that they needed to enact robust protection shielding youth from exposure to cannabis and cannabis advertising. I would hope that this admonishment we would take to heart and understand that it is a predatory industry that we're dealing with when we talk about big pot. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from our next caller. Good morning. My name is Diane Grace. As a mother to children in their late 30s and early 40s, I was upset to read recently about the research that has linked cannabis use to heart attack risk in adults under age 45. Adults 30 to 45 who have consumed marijuana more than four times in the last month suffered almost double the amount of heart attacks compared to those who were not users. The reasons for connection could be related to higher heart rates and blood pressures attributed to cannabis use, as well as the high potency of the products today. Dr. Sharif Moore, who is an epidemiologist and received his master's in public health, excuse me, received his Ph.D. from UCSD, he remarked, quote, there is a common misconception that any level of marijuana use is safe. However, the marijuana being used today is much more potent than what was encountered in the bygone hippie era, end of quote. The study also noted that marijuana use is contributing to a, quote, burgeoning public health crisis that is only getting started and will get much worse unless lawmakers act quickly to rein in the newest addition to the for-profit addiction industry. End of quote. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Audra, so I would like to take into question Wilma Wilton's license if it is expired or not because um, everything that she does in this county, having the power to decide what happens with um, millions of people's health and livelihood, the decisions that she's making are questionable because if you have an increase in cases all the time and you're increasing vaccines, I mean, it's common sense to know that that is why that's happening. You are using a PCR test that has been recalled. You can't even keep up with the testing, number one. Number two, it doesn't even differentiate between the flu and COVID. Yet you're bringing on all of these variants and claiming that's why we have to stay closed and out of these meetings. You guys need to get on track with this because what you're doing is killing people and you don't even care about it. You don't even um, understand what Wilma has done to this county, but you guys are also a huge part of that. You have somebody telling you every time she reads stuff, she doesn't even know what she's talking about. She's getting this information funneled. She is not um, um, able to um, do this in a way that is going to save lives. She's actually taking lives, and the fact that she wants to vaccinate 
babies is terrifying because then that's the last bit of people that she has to get. And at this point, if children are in the hospitals and they're dying from myocarditis and or have to have a heart transplant at some point in their life, this is permanent damage that you guys are doing to these people. And so if Wilma's going to continue on this, I would like her license to um, be proven to be valid because um, this is pretty ridiculous. And if, if you guys can't see it, but everybody else can, that everything you do is just perpetuating the problem even more, and you want to blame it on people who are unvaccinated, um, it's ridiculous. Thank you. Your time is up. We'll go to our next caller. Robert German, public comment. You can go ahead and start speaking. Thank you. Peter Drinkwater, or excuse me, Robert German, Lakeside. Peter Drinkwater, former county airports director, said to KPBS, we all know the airplane has changed the world, and we will soon find out just how it will change this part of El Cajon. What an understatement. In less than 90 days, six people have died in fatal plane crashes in the East County cities. This is a result of a failed strategic plan by the San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, which the, the Board of Supervisors has supported. Along with the six fatalities, planes have landed in our schoolyards, crashed on our streets, into our homes, had collisions on tarmacs, near misses in the air and runoff runways. This strategic plan is a disaster. I have included an attachment of 19 airliners at Lindbergh Field that are waiting for departure with engines idling, polluting the air and costing airlines thousands of dollars. This again is an example of a disaster plan. We are spending billions of taxpayers' dollars to add a remodel to remodel Terminal 1 and 10 gates for even more air traffic to our county airports. Please show the citizens why this plan is an answer to our safety problems at our airports. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, this is Peggy Walker. Duck treatment has been a major topic of this board and I wanted to share with you and with the public that marijuana industry products have created a new class of victims, just like the tobacco, opiate, and pesticide industries have done. And helping those victims fight back is the Cannabis Industry Victims Educating Litigators Organization or CIVIL, C-I-V-E-L. CIVIL works to make the marijuana industry legally accountable to victims. It educates the public and legal profession to recognize issues such as marijuana medical fraud or malpractice, dangerous interaction with other drugs, liability for contaminated products, products that cause damage to children, cause birth defects, brain damage, child abuse caused by parental use, marijuana addiction, and pollution caused by marijuana growth. It also warns about products that pose risk of poisoning, psychosis, autism, lung and cardiac damage, cancer, depression, suicide, cannabis hypermesis syndrome, PTSD use, allergic reactions, and other harms. These are well-documented risks. From marijuana that require warnings. However, cities and the state have done little to provide the warnings or the counter protections normally attached to harmful products. Supervisors, please consider the physical and mental dangers you are posing to constituents and the victims you may create by forcing non FDA approved medical or marijuana products into our county. We need better regulations. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to our next caller. Good 
Good morning, Supervisors. Happy New Year to all of you. My name is Russell Walsh. As before, I'm here hoping to advance full access to and protection of Loveland Reservoir for your constituents. Today, I have some updates. Most of this has been sent to you with fuller validating information in the last few weeks. The Sweetwater Authority refused a request for professional mediation at my expense with the San Diego Association of Realtors Mediation Partner. Our neglectful government partner in the U.S. Forest Service also rejected mediation with me. The Sweetwater Authority has once again closed both of our lakes, not just Loveland, but also the Sweetwater Re Reservoir in the South Bay and Loveland Reservoir in Lake and Alpine. This was not due to COVID, but to management issues. They are taking the available staff of the lake off the lake assignments that serve to facilitate access to these much needed resources of socially distant outdoor recreation to clear brush. If in fact this brush clearing was urgent, any land clearing, clearing contractor in the region would be glad to have the work. These actions by Sweetwater Authority show why I am here. Public trust and recreation are much lower priorities for this so-called public partner than they should be. Supervisor, and okay, so this is getting to um, back to the bigger problem, just, you know, trying to find a long-term fix for these public trust violations and, and the, the basically neglect of the public recreation at Loveland. Supervisor Anderson's chief of staff brought the large legal needs to the attention of county council. My understanding is that county council needs this board, that, that's um, all you ladies and gentlemen, um, as their appropriate client to work toward the goals of installing productive public partnership so that your constituents can peacefully enjoy these lakes in the condition they should be in and on appropriate schedules for access. I will be in contact through email and work with Supervisor, Supervisor Anderson's office in the hopes that we can reopen Sweetwater Reservoir and reopen and salvage Loveland Reservoir public rights there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. For the remaining callers that requested to speak on a matter not listed on the agenda, please hang up and call back at the conclusion of the session. Chair Fletcher, that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is approval of the statement of proceedings minutes for the regular meeting on December 8, 2021 and the County of San Diego Sanitation District meeting on December 8, 2021. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. Second. All right, we have a motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson. Let me ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We don't have a uh, consent uh, calendar today. We will move into our four discussion items, our three agenda items and our sanitation district notice public hearing. Uh, we will begin uh, with agenda item number one, authorizing micro enterprise home kitchens operating in San Diego County. Uh, before we get the staff presentation on this, let me ask uh, Supervisors Anderson or Supervisors Vargas, they initiated this action. If they would like to make any introductory comments, if not, we can go directly to the staff presentation. I'll happily defer to uh, Supervisor Vargas. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Anderson. This is a really unique opportunity for us to help uplift uh, non-traditional food entrepreneurs who are usually women, immigrants, and people of color and have faced uh, you know, uh, historical barriers entrepreneurs. I'm happy to uh, share my thoughts more on it, but I think uh, our staff presentation uh, will provide a lot of the information and questions that folks may have, and then we can go through that. And I'm um, happy to make a motion after that. All right, perfect. After the staff presentation, Vice Chair, we'll come back to you uh, for a, a motion and uh, your recommendation and options. With this, let me turn it over to staff for their presentation. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. My name is Amy Harbert, and I'm the director of the Department of Environmental Health and Quality, or DEHQ. With me today is Heather Bonomo, the DEHQ Division Director of Environmental Health, and Vince Nicoletti, Deputy Director in Planning and Development Services, or PDS. On September the 15th, the board directed staff to explore options to establish and regulate home kitchen businesses called Micro Enterprise Home Kitchen Operations, or MECOs for short, throughout the region. Today we will share information on MECOs, feedback from the community, both of which have informed our recommendations for your consideration. MECOs are home-based food businesses that prepare and sell meals directly to customers to be consumed on site taken to go or delivered directly to customers, similar to a mini restaurant. 
In 2019, state law, known as the California Retail Food Code, or CRFC, established Migos as a new type of food facility. The CRFC establishes statewide health and sanitation standards for foodborne illness prevention and the regulation of food facilities, such as restaurants, food trucks, or grocery stores. DEHQ is the local enforcement agency of the CRFC throughout the region, and we conduct inspections at food facilities that include reviewing practices to prevent the occurrence of foodborne illness. State law requires that MECOs are only allowed to operate when authorized by the governing body of the local enforcement agency. The Board of Supervisors has the authority to authorize a local MECO program for the entire region, including all 18 cities and the unincorporated communities. The CRFC provides requirements and restrictions for MECOs. For example, MECOs must be operated by a resident of a private home or apartment, and MECOs are limited to the number of meals made, types of foods and food preparation allowed, as well as the maximum number of employees and gross annual sales. MECOs must sell food directly to customers and cannot operate as a cottage food operator, caterer, temporary event, or mobile food vendor in the home. State law prohibits jurisdictions from imposing any new restrictions on MECOs for zoning purposes. Jurisdictions can, however, investigate and enforce their existing local regulations, including but not limited to code compliance. State law does not allow for cities to opt in or to opt out of a MECO program. DEHQ staff reached out to the community and local jurisdictions in a variety of methods, including conducting outreach and engagement in approximately 50 stakeholder meetings. We hosted four public workshop workshops, including offering translation in the five threshold languages most commonly spoken in the San Diego County area, Arabic, Spanish, Filipino, Chinese, and Vietnamese, with 178 attendees. Our engagement efforts included inviting all 18 jurisdictions and the unincorporated area to participate in multi-city collaborative meetings and in one-on-one -on -one meetings, presenting at four city council meetings and two county advisory board meetings, as well as unincorporated community planning groups, the local chambers of commerce, and interested local stakeholder and community organizations. DEHQ also created a dedicated MECO webpage, phone line, and email, developed an online feedback form that was accessible by QR code, and directly emailed more than 15,000 permitted food facilities and individuals who subscribed to a MECO interest list. In summary, we received comments and feedback on benefits of MECOs as well as some potential concerns. The predominant benefit heard was, so, was the socioeconomic benefit of providing a low-cost startup option for a small food business that could also provide additional resources to communities without options for healthy food choices. Some of the recurring concerns that we heard were regarding potential impacts to lo local wastewater infrastructure, increases in community complaints related to traffic, noise, and trash, and a reduction of available parking for neighborhood residents. The majority of respondents during our engagement either supported authorizing a MECO program or temporarily authorizing a MECO program for a period of two years to gather data on food safety, complaints, and potential community impacts. If a program is authorized, MECOs will be subject to the requirements established in the California Retail Food Code and to any local requirements in an adopted ordinance. There are food safety components not specified in the Retail Food Code that the Board can consider including in a local ordinance. Based on community feedback, what we learned from Riverside County's MECO program, and best practices for protecting public health and preventing foodborne illness, staff recommendations on the local ordinance food safety components are noted in Action Sheet, Attachment A. In summary, these include requiring a food safety certificate as part of the MECO application, recommendation 4A, allowing food storage outside of the residence only if stored in a refrigerator or freezer, recommendation 5A, allowing one MECO per residence consistent with the California Department of Public Health's guidance, recommendation 6A, and for MECO operators on well water, verify potable water via a full panel of testing at the time of application, consistent with requirements for cottage food operators, recommendation 7A. And for the ongoing well water testing, staff recommendation is 8C, requiring a bacteriological test annually, which is also consistent with our cottage food operators. 
Vince Nicoletti will now discuss the board's option to address public nuisances in the unincorporated communities. If the county receives complaints for possible land use violations, such as noise or solid waste associated with Amico in an unincorporated community, staff would apply existing public nuisance regulations. Staff believe most public nuisances can be resolved by Amico through education and voluntarily modifying its operations. In consideration of possible community impacts, one jurisdiction in California amended their public nuisance regulations to further define public nuisances at Mico's. Two options are provided for board consideration on this topic for the unincorporated county. For option 9A, the county would continue applying it, its existing land use regulations to address any land use impacts with Mico's. Option 9B would be to adopt amendments to our regulatory code to further define that a Mico could be considered a public nuisance. Staff recommend option 9A. If a MECO program is approved, staff will track any complaints within the unincorporated communities. If existing regulations are insufficient to address violations in the future, staff would develop options for additional enforcement tools based on data gathered. The initial cost to start a MECO business are estimated to be around $740, which include the cost of a food safety manager certificate, a CRFC requirement, that would be obtained through an approved food safety training school and cost around $150. And DEHQ's initial MECO permit fee, which is currently $588. The board is requested to find that the options presented are exempt from CEQA and provide direction on the recommendations in the action sheet attachment A, including direction on authorization of Amigo program by either selecting option 2A to authorize Amigo program or 2B decline to authorize Amigo program. If the board authorizes Amigo program, there's a request to add one staff year in DEHQ to account for the additional work associated with Amigos, as well as a request to waive board policy B29 related to department responsibility for cost recovery for Amigo permit fees that are set at 2019 rates and do not presently cover the full cost of services. If the board selects option 2A and authorizes a MECO program, the board is requested to provide direction on the type of authorization by selecting either option 3A to authorize a MECO program by ordinance or option 3B to temporarily authorize a MECO program by ordinance for a period of two years. Additionally, the board is requested to provide direction on the food safety components by choosing one recommendation in each category previously discussed and included in an action sheet as items four through eight. Finally, the board is requested to provide direction regarding public nuisance regulations to address potential community issues arising from MECOs in the unincorporated communities by selecting either option 9A to continue with existing regulations and collect data or option 9B to amend the regulatory code. Any option of the proposed ordinances would require two steps. If the board takes action on 3A, 3B, or 9B today, then on January 26, the associated ordinances would be brought back for a second reading and adoption and would be effective 30 days after adoption. This concludes our staff presentation and we are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, let me go first to Vice Chair Vargas and then we'll go to Supervisor Anderson. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I am, uh, again, really thrilled that Supervisor Anderson and I uh, were able to introduce this. And I want to first and foremost thank Amy, Heather, and also Nick and the whole Department of the Environmental Health and Quality for your hard work in bringing these options to the Board of Supervisors that is going to lead us to authorize uh, MECO's program here in San Diego County. I think we've mentioned before that this, when this item came back in September that these actions could not have come at a better time uh, when our board is committed to helping our communities and their journey to economic recovery. We have an opportunity, very unique opportunity to really uplift non-traditional food entrepreneurs um, in, in, during a really uh, challenging time for so many. So these entrepreneurs represent an informal food economy that has been present in our communities for decades. But during the pandemic, we saw more and more of these ventures pop up in our communities. I think if you have Instagram or Facebook, you've seen them and you probably have purchased food from them. And so this board letter is going to remove barriers. And as policymakers, I think we have a great opportunity to help our, our communities, you know, really thrive. And so um, Mikos is going to provide uh, so many small businesses with an economic lifeline, benefiting our economy now and in the future. And it doesn't compete with local restaurants and it doesn't compete with local small businesses either. So 
Um, these established partnerships with the community and local government are going to help our um, empower home chefs to become trained and licensed. Uh, legally permitted micos can serve as incubators for aspiring re uh, restaurateurs to test out and vet a menu while learning the basics of what it takes to run a small-scale retail operation. So I want to ensure that families and businesses in our region are thriving and not just surviving, and Nikos opens the door for home cooks to do just that. So again, thank you to Supervisor uh, Anderson. I would like to make a motion to support uh, the following options for the actions uh, from the action uh, sheet that was given to us. Uh, option one, there's no need to do additional environmental analysis on these actions today, so action one. And then option two, I would recommend option 2A, which authorizes a microenterprise home kitchen operations program. Uh, we've heard uh, a lot of feedback from stakeholders, and, and uh, we've made sure that the ordinance includes a lot of re their recommendations. And option three, we were recommending option 3B, uh, temporarily authorize a MECO program by ordinance for a period of two years by allowing this temporary authorization, this border allows to review the data and it's going to come back to fully authorized after evaluating the success of the program, which I think is really, really good. We've seen what happened in Riverside, but I think this will allow us to provide and get additional information. Um, that was 3B. And then on number four, food safety certificate, I want to support that we require uh, 4A, which is uh, require a food safety so, uh, safety certificate that we submitted as part of the MECO application. And this is, uh, we learned again from Riverside County that that was uh, very, very helpful. Uh, number five, it would be 5A. So only allow food storage in areas outside of the residence, including garages, outdoor sheds, workshops, et cetera. If it's stored inside a refrigerator or freezer, uh, um, we, we think that's a good thing. And then number six, um, it would be 6A, only allow one MECO to operate in each residence in accordance with the California Department of Public Health guidance. And then on number seven, uh, 7A, which requires a full panel of testing be submitted as part of the MECO application. Uh, this is the same testing uh, cottage food operators are currently required to submit, so we think that's a fair process. On number eight, we are recommending 8C, require only bacteri bacteriological testing results be submitted annually. This is the same testing um, cottage operators are currently required to submit with the permit application as well. And then on number nine, number 9A, to continue, I think at this time, it's really important for us to continue with existing regulations and collect data in unincorporated communities. And so um, I think uh, there's th this will serve as a great opportunity for us to really uh, do the right thing. And so I'm in strong support of this item um, with the outlined uh, recommendations, and I'm confident that through this program we can make true transformational change throughout the county uh, by uplifting people's entrepreneurial spirit and the desire to enrich their communities through the delicious cooking and uh, respectfully request the support of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a motion. Uh, I'm happy to second. Let's go to Supervisor Anderson, then we'll go to Supervisor Watson Reamer. I, uh, well, you kind of took a little wind out of my sails because I was going to second it, <laughs> but I, I would like to point I, out. I will. This, this was your action. I will withdraw my second and I will register you, Supervisor Anderson. Well, I don't have people think I'm getting wind was your in motion, my own, I, I in my own board letter. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> hey, uh, so uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is we did a, a lot of outreach. Uh, some of the cities in my district were initially against it, but later sent letters of support. And a lot of it is just fear. They uh, they don't understand what's happening. But I want to point out quickly that in 24 cities, there's 130 MECOs operating right now. And there's only been two complaints in all that time. And this has been a highly successful program. And I think that uh, some of the city's concerns uh, or are overstated and overworried. They're overthinking it. So for example, we're capped at, at 60 meals a week. If you, I mean, excuse me, 50 meals, yeah, 60 meals a week. If you divide that by three, we're, we're talking about fewer than three family members. So we're not talking about a huge number. Uh, one of the concerns they said was, well, you know, we're gonna have all this additional traffic. Well, in all those cities, they accept Uber Eats. In all those cities, Domino's is allowed to deliver and other pizza companies are allowed to deliver. This is nothing more than what they're doing. It's just framed differently to give uh, people an opportunity to make ends meet. And it also provides a great service because people are getting quality food from their neighbors. 
uh, most of the Mikos uh, don't draw across the city. They draw, they draw people within a, a, a handful of miles from their home. No one's going to drive to from Alpine to Del Mar or from Del Mar to Chula Vista for a Miko. However, uh, in their own community where people are trying to make ends meet, uh, it's not uncommon for them to do it. And because the cap is so low, they don't compete with restaurants in any way, shape, or form. However, they do allow people to develop the proof of concept. And if they choose to move forward with a restaurant, this is a great way to understand that their menu works and there's a lot of support for the food that they're producing. So, I, you know, on every level, I just believe this is a terrific program. I was glad to vote for it when I was in the legislature. And it was a campaign promise when I was running for office that I would move forward with this. And so I'm, I'm grateful uh, for the support that we're going to receive today. And I'm optimistic that we're going to get that support. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson. We'll go to Supervisor Lawson Reamer and then Supervisor Desmond. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also incredibly excited about this program. Um, I first want to thank staff for your extensive community outreach and information gathering. Um, this is going to help local cooks and chefs produce food at their homes on, and while ensuring health and safety standards are met. And I think what I'm most excited about is that this encourages um, local businesses and startups um, and creates opportunities for people who other would, otherwise could find it really, really difficult uh, to start a business. Um, it can be, and I look forward to this being a really important uh, rung on the ladder towards economic well-being for families. Um, I think this kind of program is especially important for parents of young children or parents of children with special needs who need to be in the home and need to figure out how to take care of their loved ones, uh, but also need to provide for their families economically. Mm -hmm. And so so, you know, especially single parents uh, face this dual, really, really difficult dual challenge. And I think this creates opportunities to make ends meet um, while also being present um, for people who, who need them in the house. Um, and I really appreciate that the creation of this program is data driven. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing how well this works. Um, so that based on the data, we can improve the program in, in the future. Um, so I just wanted to offer two friendly amendments. Um, you know, partly because, as uh, Supervisor Anderson mentioned, you know, when in the consultations I've had with a lot of the mayors in, in my um, in my district, there definitely is you know a lot of fear and concern, um, and it's I think definitely comes from um, kind of a, the unknown, right? Um, and doing things differently, and so we do know that in Riverside and other places this has been implemented. Uh, there's been it's just been uh, kind of all positive uh, for everyone and creating new opportunities for healthy foods that local. Uh, but um, I do think it's important to to make sure that we're collecting the data so that we can, uh, you know, monitor where, where and how um, the program might need to be improved moving forward. Um, so my first amendment would be to direct the chief administration officer to work with all the jurisdictions within the region on a voluntary basis to gather data re related to MECO implementation during authorization, including but not limited to potential community impacts such as traffic, noise, wastewater, and code or nuisance complaints, as well as food safety related data, such as number of permitted MECOs, complaints or reports of foodborne illness, and retail food safety compliance. Um, so that would be my first amendment. I can repeat it if you want, or just uh, email it um, if that's easier. And just wanna emphasize that's meant to be voluntary. You know, We don't wanna put additional burdens on our cities, uh, but to the extent that they want to uh, gather that data, uh, that we wanna create a mechanism uh, to do so, so that we, we can um, you know, keep track of any potential challenges and be able to improve the program in two years um, after the pilot. Um, and then the second uh, amendment, um, uh, again, is about empowering our cities with information. I've heard from cities in my district, and I know staff has been very supportive in doing extensive outreach and working with them to address concerns. Um, so I would just want to be even more specific in the board's action today in support of those efforts. Um, and so I'd like to offer the additional friendly amendment to direct the chief administration officer to provide information and educational trainings for cities, staff, and operational leads in all of our jurisdiction in the region in order to share best practices to reduce, prevent, and or address nuisance activity, uh, including possible approaches to related local land use and nuisance regulations. Um, so if the maker of the motion would be amenable to these two friendly amendments, I will be really excited to see this move forward today in the county. 
Yes. Uh, oh. Vice Chair. Yes, happy to accept them. Just uh, FYI, there's there was a lot of work that uh, staff um, uh, did around particularly these issues, and those um, items were not necessarily in the ordinance, but were already included in the in the guidelines. And so, happy to happy to uh, accept them. Thank you. All right. So what we're going to need to do there, those were pretty long uh, um, amendments. If you could email with them, uh, if we can get them to the clerk, we're going to need to restate them before we vote, just so we're all clear on exactly what we're voting on. So uh, while we hear from Supervisor Desmond, maybe we can get those to the clerk. I'll send it right now. I'm the yeah. Nathan. I'm the second on the motion, and yeah. I have to accept it as well. Of course, of course. I, I would just like to ask staff how much of that is already included in it. So they're not, we're not duplicating what's already in it. And then the second thing is, uh, I'm happy to accept that, but I have a concern that we're holding a higher standard than we do for Uber Eats. We're holding a higher standard. We don't collect this data on Uber Eats. We don't collect this data on pizza delivery. We don't collect this data on Tupperware parties. We don't collect this data anywhere else. And if we're going to do it, perhaps we should collect the data on a level playing field, because if we're going to allow uh, one industry to move forward, uh, it should be a level playing field for uh, uh, single parents who are trying to make ends meet, and we're not putting a higher burden on them than we would corporate America. Yeah, so I love that. Sorry, Supervisor Anderson, yeah. I love that. I don't know exactly how to implement that, but I fully agree with your sentiment. I, I so think, I think that we one of the ways we can do it is simply say that uh, we want to collect all the data and support all the data that they're already collecting on those corporate America uh, and, and cap it at that. So if they're collecting that data on corporate America, great. If they're not, they don't get a second standard because they uh, have fears of, of single parents trying to make ends meet. So I, I, we got to we got something we we got to uh, reconcile here. Um, and, and supervisor, I, I'm I'm with you there on you know we're we're going to hold families to 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 a standard that that you know we, we don't hold other people in the food service industry to as well. And so I think we got to reconcile all of these. We either create one standard and we try to capture data on all of that, or or we we do the opposite. Let me let me ask staff real quick. Um, just if they have any any thoughts on the discussion that's taking place, then I'll come back to to Vice Chair Vargas, and we'll see if we can we can. I think we're all in agreement what we're trying to do. So I think it's just a matter of figuring out how we uh, how we navigate doing this. But let me give staff a chance to weigh in um, on the issues that have been raised around uh, around this this, this particular uh, issue. <clears throat> Yes, uh, Chair Fletcher, Supervisors, um, DEHQ uh, has a, a practice in our retail food program, in particular when there's a new program that we're implementing to collect and gather data on how that is going. Um, we frequently have touch points uh, with cities as we implement our retail food program, and so we would be happy to uh, work with them on a voluntary basis to uh, gather that data collaboratively um, as this is a new program area. Um, in regards to that data, uh, we do not have any regulatory authority over third-party food vendors. Uh, we collect data in regards to permitted food facilities. Amico would be a permitted food facility underneath the California Retail Food Code just as a restaurant, so that would be our area of purview. Vice Chair, what's your, your thoughts on... Uh so I don't think this creates an extra layer. I mean, I think this data is going to be included. I, uh, you know, um, we did a lot. We had a lot of conversations with the local cities around this, um, and Amy and Heather have been very, very helpful and thorough in this process. So, um, Supervisor Anderson, I agree with you that we don't want to create an extra burden on folks, which is why uh, I was. It was really important to me that if we were going to ensure that we're collecting this data, that it's voluntary. The data gets collected anyway. So I think the fact that it's just emphasized and it's written down, uh, I, I don't think it creates a greater burden, but um, I think, you know, I, I, I'm okay with supporting it. So maybe maybe what we could do, and then um, I also, uh, we went straight from staff presentation into discussion, which is good. We, we do have a couple of public speakers in this item. So I think we'll land the plane here, we'll go to our speakers and then we'll come back. But Supervisor Anderson, one, one suggestion might be, you know, if we do this voluntary program, then we, we add a component to support state legislation to authorize the collection of this for other food service folks. Um, and, and we go pursue, if, if we don't have a mechanism to do that now, 
uh, maybe we can add that to our ledge platform that, that you know, we would like to support legislative efforts to give us the authority uh, to do this on Uber Eats and DoorDash and, and, and the rest of the folks, if that if that works. Okay, so let's do this. Um, while Supervisor uh, Lawson Reamer gets her uh, amendment language to the clerk, um, so we can type it up. I want to be able to put it up on screen so everyone knows what they're voting on and the public knows what we're voting on. Uh, while all of that works, why don't we hear from our public speakers in this item and then we'll come back um, and, uh, and, and see where we are. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 13 requests to speak by phone. I would also like to note for the record that we did receive 85 e-comments on this item, 78, fa 78 in favor and one in opposition. Any members of the public that requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions provided to you. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. You will have two minutes to address the, the board. Please begin by stating your name for the record. I would also like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin to speak. We will begin with our first caller. Hi, this is Ron Morrison. Um, I believe this proposal is very well-meaning, but we all know that small business brick-and-mortar restaurants are already some of the most difficult small business opportunities to succeed. This legislation was written with rural areas with very little access for any prepared food services, such as areas of Riverside and San Bernardino County, not for a dense urban area with an abundance of both small mom-and-pop and both corporate food services. A small brick and mortar restaurant has to deal with all the expenses that come with having a business, the rent, the insurance, staffing, and all the regulations. Amico gets to cherry pick its hours, reduce health and safety, uh, and building regulations, and an oversight that is practically impossible to enforce. I've heard it said that this would be a pathway for people to be able to open a brick and mortar business. Why would anyone go from something that has no overhead, off the books, cash business, and to go in and to basically go into something that is so uh, difficult, such as a brick and mortar business. Also saying that this will be for healthy foods. There's nothing in here saying you cannot use lard at these, at these facilities. Uh, I'm sure there's gonna be short-term success stories, but in the long term, that's different. While this is being put forward as a way for individuals to be able to bring in additional revenue, in reality, it should be put forward as a way for families to lose their life savings, children's college funds, and homes because they opened a brick-and-mortar restaurant and provided meaningful jobs and services to their community and will not be, uh, but now will be put at a much greater disadvantage. This proposal um, can only be considered as an anti-small business proposal. Uh, I appreciate, you know, the comments constantly made about Single, uh, single parents. There's nothing here about this being single parents one way or another. This is about small businesses that already exist. Ours is a city that is filled with mom and pop small restaurants, and we want them to succeed. I'm afraid this is a way that this would not happen. Uh, I wish you that you would look real hard look at this. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. My name is Cynthia Fleur Quinones. I'm a retired healthcare executive chef, food service manager, and former certified dietary manager who lives in National City. Given my years at Paradise Valley Hospital and Scripps Mercy and Hillcrest before that, I know all too well the terrible price paid by San Diego County residents with limited access to a diversity of healthy food options, especially those in neighborhoods considered food deserts. As you know, too, the consequences include preventable high rates of diabetes, obesity, and other poor health outcomes. I strongly believe MAKOs can be a critical tool for improving local food options by community members for their neighbors, and I very much look forward to working on ways to ensure this, together with San Diego Food System Alliance members favoring MAKO approval. I am personally committed to offering educational support of MAKOs during startup and operations, 
so they can live up to their full potential here. Please know that good food activists like me are here in, to help make those be a true value add across San Diego County. Thank you so much for your consideration of, of this option. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. My name is John Alvarado, and I'm the executive director of a program called the Good Neighbor Project San Diego. I work with approximately 3,500 families in the Barrio Logan area. Now, I understand that many people would say this would be, uh, uh, these uh, meals would be in competition with other restaurants and whatnot, but that's not really the case. Many of our people cannot afford to go spend uh, $10 for three little tacos, and this would allow them to go ahead and uh, make a little bit of money uh, from the same people that wouldn't go to those uh, restaurants because of the uh, price. That being said, uh, it would also help them in terms of making some extra money. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed uh, one of the comments where it would allow uh, families who have uh, at-risk children, uh, children with uh, different types of uh, ailments where they're required to stay at home, and it would allow the parents to continue to take care of them. I thank you very much, and this thing is so, so incredibly a wonderful program that everyone should be supporting. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, Chairman Fletcher and honorable members of the board. Chris Duggan with the California Restaurant Association. Before I begin on my comments, I'd like to thank and applaud the county staff including Ryan Johnson, Heather Bonomo, and Amy Harbert for their comprehensive outreach to CRA over the past five to six months uh, with both the stakeholders as well as the community as a whole. During the 2018 legislative session of the California legislature, CR the CRA worked closely on AB 626. It is today and always has been a mission of CRA to support the entrepreneurial spirit, especially micro enterprise, and assist those wishing to take the first step in entering the restaurant industry. However, the CRA did initially have concerns specifically related to the lack of local control has been stated today by municipalities. It is our concern that local municipalities would not be allowed to provide their own ordinance. However, we are pleased to hear today by Supervisor Lawson Reamer in her comments related to collecting data by each and every municipality across San Diego County and then reporting back to the County of San Diego. Additionally, during stakeholder outreach conducted by county staff, CRA raised several concerns as it relates to the California Retail Code and the implementation of food and safety procedures by these new METAs. Again, today we are happy to report that those concerns have been resolved by county staff. It is for these reasons CRA is in full support of item 2A and authorization of item 3B uh, for the NICO program in San Diego County. Again, want to thank each and every one on county staff for the hard work on this. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Board of Supervisors, thank you so much for your time. My name is Roya Bagheri, and I'm a native San Diego resident, a co-lead of the San Diego Miko Coalition, and the executive director of the Cook Alliance. The Cook Alliance is a leading nonprofit voice for home food entrepreneurs nationwide and the primary sponsor of AB 626. We have supported the implementation efforts in other counties, as well as MECO legislation in other states across the country. San Diego is the exact type of community that AB 626 was intended to assist their incredible diverse population, as well as the food swamps and food deserts in our communities. Our organization has actively supported Nico chefs, the majority of whom are women and people of color with education and resources, and they're an incredible tool for economic development and especially economic recovery and empowerment during these unprecedented times. Nico's create an inclusive path pathway that empowers entrepreneurs to generate income while providing flexibility for those that need to work from home, such as caretakers. Additionally, MECO's increase consumer access to diverse, healthy local foods and create stronger community ties. 
as a local attorney, I've spoken with a number of individuals individuals here in San Diego who are already operating in the shadows and social media sites such as Facebook and Instagram, and a formal MECO program will not only help them, but it will also protect public health by creating clear, tailored regulations and training. I also wanted to express my appreciation for the San Diego DEHQ and their incredible outreach to the community throughout this process. We look forward to hopefully continuing to work with them to support a potential rollout in the community. In conclusion, we've seen the incredible impact of the MECO program on inclusion, incubation, and innovation in local communities and urge San Diego County to provide this opportunity for our residents. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Um, good morning, supervisors and the board. My name is Delilah Davis, and I've lived here in San Diego for 51 years, and I served in the Navy for 10 years here in San Diego, and I'm now a 100% uh, disabled veteran. Um, recently, I had considered selling my home of 18 years to move to Riverside County, uh, where the Meckless Law had been instituted. And so uh, when I heard that San Diego would be voting to consider instituting this law, I saw a new hope in the city that I call home to be able to conduct business from home, uh, benefiting my community with my services, and MECO also benefiting uh, my family, uh, allowing us to continue uh, living and working in a place that, that we call home. Um, so I'm asking you to please consider um, approving MECO's in San Diego, um, as there are so many benefits um, to us all who are affected by a disapproval vote. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Hi, my name is Karen Melvin, and I am a co-lead with the San Diego Mico Coalition. First, I'd like to congratulate the board for your vote in September 21 that began a process of consideration and discussion of MECOs that has brought us to this historic moment today. I especially want to thank Supervisor Anderson and Vice Chair Vargas for their leadership in bringing MECOs before the board. The people of San Diego County have spoken, and it is overwhelmingly in favor of the board authorizing a MECO program for the county. 75% of those responding to DEHQ's community outreach were in favor of MECOs. Over 30 local organizations across the county have written letters of support to this board in favor of MECOs. Mayors and or council members from five incorporated cities have publicly expressed support in favor of MECOs. And over 85 written comments have been submitted to the board in favor of MECOs. And these are just the people willing to be identified by name. There are hundreds of residents of San Diego County who sell their home cooked food in the shadows away from the spotlight. They do this to pay the bills, provide for their families, and because they love to cook. But they do not want to be publicly identified for fear of fines and being shut down. However, these are the people who have asked us to speak on their behalf and communicate to you how much they are eager and excited for the opportunities Mikos would afford them to come out of the shadows and into being proud, trained, inspected, and certified micro-business owners. I strongly am in support of the board voting for option 2A to authorize MECO program. And while I and 58% of the community respondents support option 3A for authorizing a MECO program by ordinance, I am open to and will support 3B for a temporary program if needed, because I am confident that the data will show at the end of the two-year program what an overwhelming benefit MECOs are to the community. In your hands today is the opportunity to change the lives of hundreds of families for the better by the inclusion, incubation, and innovation of MECOs to enhance our communities and county. Please do the good and right thing today and make MECOs a reality in San Diego County. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Hello, my name is Karina Gonzalez. I'm a council member in the city of Vista, and I am 100% in support of Mikos, I think that trying to compare it to a small restaurant is just not a uh, not a good comparison. Um, there's a lot of restrictions on the amount of meals that you can make. 
but it's just enough to allow someone independence. You know, I grew up in a city where this is something that all my neighbors know about. We know that there are home kitchen operations. What we want to do is to bring them into a regulatory framework so that way people can be protected. The consumer can be protected knowing that there are best practices in that kitchen and the uh, operator can be protected knowing that they've been inspected and they have you know, the proper training to uh, handle food and create it. Um, I also want to state that, you know, I've personally seen, as many of you, how difficult this pandemic has been for our senior community. And if there are more neighborhood uh, restaurants, you know, then we probably wouldn't be talking about this. But the way that we have grown our cities has not been smart and we're sprawled out. So people need to have access points for healthy food, and Miko's is going to be the way to do it. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on this. I got to head back to my trash pickup. I do it every Wednesday. So um, I hope you all have a blessed uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning, Supervisors. Thank you, Supervisor Vargas, for your support for Mako's in San Diego County. I am Chef Ryan Rizzuto, the executive chef at local nonprofit Kitchens for Good and chef and owner of Southside Biscuits, a local pop-up restaurant in South Park. At Kitchens for Good, we educate trauma-impacted San Diegans on knife skills and life skills to give confidence, job training, and job placement at over 150 employer partner restaurants in the county. Yesterday, I taught a lesson on pizza making. In my, in my lecture, I spoke about the impact of immigration and how it can amplify, diversify, and promote food options in neighborhoods. This is how we have a variety of delicious pizza options like New York style, Chicago, and Detroit style options. By passing Miko's in San Diego County, we are choosing to, di to diversify our food options in our neighborhoods. We will provide opportunities for chefs and creatives of color, open the doors for more minority and women-owned businesses, and elevate our food economy in San Diego. Thank you for supporting Mako's and our creative chefs in the city. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Audra, so why you guys want to micromanage almost every aspect of our life. You want people to come out of the shadows so that they can be, make just enough meals to allow them to be independent. I don't know why we're always asking for permission to do things in life, like, like we have to come to you. You guys are our servants. You should be asking us for permission. We shouldn't be asking for permission to make money where it goes whatever it is but you guys have to know every aspect of that that's why you want to collect all this data i mean you would collect data on everybody if you knew uh that you could do that um but the fact is i mean why would it's just like marijuana you wanted them to come out of the shadows just so that you could come in and tax them and basically basically take away their ability to you know make money and this is just like that why does someone need to come to you to in order to for you to tell them how many meals they can make in a week when they could do it without coming to you and making as many meals as they wanted. You guys have to be in every aspect of our life because you want to control it. It's not helping people. It's actually taking away their ability to make a livelihood when you come in and micromanage everything in our lives. So, um, I mean, the idea is nice, but I don't think anybody should be asking for permission from people who should be asking us for permission. I mean, it's your way to go, oh, well, now I'm going to um, make them pay tax or, I mean, how are you even going to regulate these kitchens? Um, I mean, are you going to hire staff for that and then we're going to have to pay for it? I mean, I don't know. Just everything you guys do creates more problems and you act like you're, this is a solution. I want you to come out of the shadows so I can micromanage everything in your life instead of you just being able to do it 
without anybody managing your business. So, yeah. Bye. Thank you. We'll hear from our next caller. Hi, this is David Sims, co-owner of Warung Riri, uh, Indonesian fine dining restaurant. We'll be open as soon as we can get the MECO permit. Um, first, I want to thank everybody for their hard work, both on the government side as well as the grassroots um, people out there. You guys, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, we're just excited that you're bringing this to vote. We can't wait for the permit. And for us, it's a stepping stone to start an actual restaurant down the road. This gives us the opportunity to, like you said, see what it's like to run a restaurant. And once we can get funding by saving our money from this, it'll allow us to then hire people here in San Diego and provide jobs for the community, which is our full intention. So, again, we want to just thank you very much. I know it's been a lot of work. I know it's been a long time coming. And there's always room for improvement, and I know we can uh, get there down the road. Um, but, again, thank you very much, and we can't wait to have you come dine with us, hopefully soon. Thank you so much for your time. Happy New Year, and God bless you. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning to all the Board of Supervisors. Thank you for bringing this up in the agenda today. My name is Diana Tapi, owner and chef of Tres Fuegos Cocina. My business is currently on hold. We started from our home, we started from our home building a successful food business. Moving to a commercial kitchen was one of my greatest accomplishments. But I soon realized that that was not going to be a possibility for us as the cost of a commercial kitchen exceeded my expectations. The food industry needs to be an equal opportunity for all. This will be something great for the San Diego community, for that stay-at-home mother that doesn't know how to do anything other than cook, for that, for that mother that has a disabled child that cannot hold a job. This is a great opportunity for everybody to share their culture, their, their, their food, everything they know. This is something great for the community, and restaurants should have no worry as the quantities we can cook in our home cannot compare to the, those cooked in a commercial kitchen or in a restaurant. We will be short-staffed here in our home. So, to Board of Supervisors, this is something great. Today you have the opportunity to make history for all San Diegans that are waiting for this, including Tres Fuegos Cocina. Thank you so much for your consideration, and please vote yes. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Good morning. My name is Kathleen Lippett. Brick and mortar restaurants already have to weigh the cost of high quality food and profits. Nico operators will have to make those same decisions even more difficult with more difficulty. If their family members are ill, they could expose customers. Who is going to define healthy home-cooked foods? The argument that legalizing and regulating home kitchens will eliminate the unlawful ones and make the permitted ones safer is the same naive argument used with marijuana legalization. The CDC reports 48 million people get sick in the U.S. every year. 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die from foodborne illnesses. The general public is typically unaware that the symptoms that they are suffering may be from foodborne illness. If they do, they're even less likely to know which agency to report their symptoms. My father was hospitalized after becoming the victim of a serious case of salmonella at his residential care facility. That same day, the dining room was empty at breakfast. All the residents who had ate the con eaten the contaminated food became ill. As a public health practitioner, I recognized the symptoms of foodborne illness and suggested they call the health department. They refused. I called the health department and reported the incident. 
The investigation that followed found nearly 100 residents in the facility had become victims of the same foodborne illness. Anyone who has suffered from foodborne illness recognizes it is no trivial matter, and it's far more so for the elderly. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. We'll go to our next caller. Rosalind Johnson. Thank you. You can begin your comments. Hi, my name is Rosalind Johnson, and I am, I am the owner of Clara's Kitchen, and I'm located in my I'm located in Emerald Hills. I actually um, had started cooking food from my home for seniors when the COVID started, so it's been about two years now, and. Um, I actually received a cease and desist letter from the County of San Diego. I had got shut down um, because I actually had got my business license and listed my home as Clara's Kitchen. So when we had a water shortage, then I was notified and I was shut down. Um, but I had started this because a lot of the, my communities and neighbors and mostly singers in my area, they didn't have any food, home cooked food. And a lot of my friends were saying, Ross, can you make um, my grandfather some food and take it to him and, you know, because I can't get over there. And, and then I have elderly neighbors around the corner. And then my whole community actually was buying food for me. And so, yes, I'm one of those behind the shadows people before I got shut down. I was one of those that was catering to my neighborhood and my friends and my family um, to make sure that they were okay and they had home cooked, home -cooked meals. Um, a lot of times, I myself am a victim of poisoning, food poisoning from restaurants. So most of the time, I don't eat out. I actually would make food for my family. My mom is actually a senior, and I cook for her every day. And so when this all came about that Riverside and all up north had already been approved, I was on board, and I started contacting the county trying to find out, okay, when are we going to be on the same level as them? This is something that we need for all of our communities not just North County and the rest of California. Um, I, am, I wish that you guys would please vote yes on this. This is something that we all need and that San Diego City needs to approve. And so that we can take care of each other. Thank you. Your and like time other is people up. were saying, we're not. Thank you. Chair Fletcher, that concludes public testimony on this item. All right, thank you to, uh, to everyone who called in. I'm just going to restate the motion uh, that is currently um, on the table. Uh, we have on the recommendations, if you go through attachment A, the worksheet on options, uh, we have a motion to adopt recommendation one, adopt recommendation 2A, uh, adopt recommendation 3B, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8C, and 9A. We also have the addition uh, of the amendment. And let me ask the clerk if we're able to uh, put the amendment on the screen. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I will do that now. And then we'll go to Supervisor Desmond. Um, Okay, is that, that's the only screen, right? Uh, Chair Fletcher, I'm sharing my screen and that has the motion on it. Okay, so what we wanna do is add a uh, recommendation number three um, that will ask county staff to uh, take steps. Here, I'll just dictate it to you. We'll, we'll see how fast your typing is. We'll, we'll check your typing skills here. Um, so it'll be to uh, direct the CAO to explore options for county to support legislative efforts uh, for greater transparency around food delivery entities. <clears throat> OK, 
Okay. So that's what we've got. We've got a motion by Vice Chair Vargas, seconded by Supervisor Anderson for the recommendations we just outlined, and then those three recommendations additionally. Uh, let me at this time go to Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate uh, all the comments you and their, their uh, departments. So I would like to, uh, you know, this initial, I had a lot of concerns about the uh, MECOs uh, initially. Um, I, uh, one of them being that, the, you know, restaurants this uh, right now are already struggling and to have more restaurants uh, popping up, would, you know, could be, uh, could put the hurt on all of them. But I was glad to hear today that uh, that should not be the case. You know, one of my biggest concerns, and 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 along with all the mayors in my uh, in North County here, I talked to five, five different cities, uh, and I think there's only one mayor that even had heard about it, uh, and I, it, it so uh, they weren't getting the uh, uh, the update on Mikos at all. So uh, one of the things that I strongly believe in is local land use authority, that local land use, and I was a mayor for 12 years. So, you know, you don't want some other entity telling you what land use, you know, what, what you have to do, what you have to accept in your community, and you really have no jurisdiction or say in it. So I don't, you know, that was one of my biggest concerns. And I had a lot, a lot of the mayors that I talked to, you know, they had a lot of questions about HOAs, about apartment buildings, like the common area and apartment building, business licenses. What about alcohol? Uh, if, can alcohol be served or can people bring their own alcohol? Um, so one of the but one of the biggest one was the land use authority being stripped from the uh, the cities, and actually this is by the state. The state's actually doing this. So I'm actually happy to see the motion of three B that allows for a two year uh, temporary program, uh, and I think this will hopefully uh, and have a time period to answer a lot of the questions uh, for many of the the my constituents up here in North County and the cities and and their. Uh, uh, city councils so for some of the questions they're going to have uh, going forward. So I'm happy to support the temporary authorization of the MECO program. And then I, I'm under the understanding, I don't know if this is, is it going to come back then in two years to the Board of Supervisors to re-up that after two years? Is that the correct understanding? I guess that's for staff. Yeah, let me ask staff to weigh in on Supervisor Desmond's question. Uh, through the chair, Supervisor Desmond, if the board uh, moves forward with authorizing or temporary authorizing a program today, then the next steps would be would we would return um, at a future meeting on January 26 for a second hearing. And then 30 days afterwards, uh, it would be adopted. And then we would come back to the board uh, before that two year sunset date um, in the ordinance drafted under the temp temporary option of 3B. Okay. And by then we'll have the data that, uh, thank you. It's uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer for putting in that uh, friendly amendment for the data collection and things like that. Uh, that'll help us uh, kind of guide the direction uh, two years from now, and hopefully everything will be okay and turns out hunky dory and uh, we can yeah. support the entrepreneurs. So thank can you. Just, just to clarify, that, that data um, request was going to be in there already. So um, yeah. this is just, it's, it, it's, we're on it. Okay, well, I just want to make, you know, so we'll have that data at that point in time and make, help us uh, make decisions to uh, further uh, implement this. But hopefully we won't get many complaints. And, and uh, so I'm happy to support. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, so we've got a motion. Uh, second, uh, I stated it earlier. Um, not seeing any additional requests to speak. Let me ask the clerk to please call the roll. Trev Fletcher, before I call the roll, I'm going to go to council for some clarification. Yes, Chair. Uh, just to clarify that the intent behind the motion is to remove the options not chosen from the attached ordinance as directed, including any optional directional language, and renumber as necessary for first and second readings. That's correct. All right. With that, let's call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. All right, we're going to go to uh, agenda item number two, notice public hearing general services purchase of agricultural conservation uh, easements. Uh, why don't we hear from our public speakers if we have any on this item, and then we'll come back to the board. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have one request to speak by phone on this item. I'd also like to note for the record that we did receive one e-comment on this item in favor 
Any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear the recording that will tell you to begin your comments. After the beep, you will have two minutes to address the board. Please begin by stating your name for the record. I would like, I would remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We will call, we will begin, uh, we will begin with our first caller. Audra, so here we go again. So you want to compensate owners for easements to reduce greenhouse gases by 2030. I love how you guys think that's going to happen. So you lost 10,000 acres and you're gaining 213 acres. And you think that's going to be a huge reduction in greenhouse gases. That's very interesting because I don't know how you guys think that's going to happen. Um, why'd you lose that land? Because you developed some stuff on it and now you got to, you know, go in another avenue, taking people's land. Do you want access to their land? Is that what it is? Because you guys like to be in everybody's business. It's fun. Oh, yeah. And I love it that you guys aren't having us in those meetings because then you can just not pay attention even more. But anyway, yeah, I'll be back for the water thing. Take care. Thank you. Chair Fletcher, that concludes public testimony on this item. Thank you. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm happy to make a motion to approve this item. This uh, actually promotes long-term preservation of agricultural land in the unincorporated area. And the, uh, with the purchase of the agricultural conservation e easement, this compensates willing property owners for placing perpetual e easements on their agricultural property. And we do want to preserve agricultural lands in, in uh, the unincorporated areas. So I'll be happy to make a motion for this item. Thank you, Supervisor. I'm happy to second that. Uh, I'm going to ask my colleagues. I don't see any additional comments or questions. Uh, we have a motion by Supervisor Desmond, seconded by myself, to approve the recommendations. Uh, let me ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanim unanimously with all supervisors being present voting aye. We're going to move to uh, agenda item number three, uh, San Pasqual Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan. Uh, I'm going to uh, go first for staff presentation. Then we'll hear from the public speakers and we'll return to the board. Thank you, Chair. Our team members are, are coming into the well right now. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. I'm Jim Bennett with Planning and Development Services and presenting with me today on item number three, the San Pasqual Valley Groundwater Sustainability Plan is Leanne Crow. In January 2015, California enacted the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, which is a framework to regulate groundwater for the first time in California history. SIGMA was enacted in response to extended statewide drought conditions diminished surface water supplies, increased groundwater pumping in the state, and growing concerns about climate change. Recognizing that groundwater resources are most effectively managed at the local level, the intent of the law is to strengthen local groundwater management of basins 
because when properly managed, groundwater resources can be maintained to protect communities, farms, and the environment during prolonged periods of drought. The state mapped and prioritized over 500 groundwater basins in which the vast majority of California's groundwater is stored and ranked those basins as very low, low, medium, and high priority. 94 of those basins ranked medium and high priority are required to be sustainably managed under this law. San Diego County has 39 basins of which three are mandated to be sustainably managed under Sigma. This includes Borrego Springs, which is a high priority, critically overdrafted basin, and the upper San Luis Rey Valley and the San Pasqual Valley basins that are ranked as medium priority. Today's hearing focuses on the San Pasqual Valley Basin, which is currently located in Districts 2, 3, and 5, but will be situated entirely in District 2 under the new voting maps approved on December 14, 2021. Sigma requires local public agencies with water supply, water management, or land use responsibilities to form groundwater sustainability agencies, or GSAs. Those GSAs are required to develop a groundwater sustainability plan and sustainably manage groundwater resources within 20 years of implementation. Sustainability plans are required to evaluate both groundwater quantity and quality and to consider all beneficial users in the basin, including plants that may be groundwater dependent. In June 2017, the board entered into an MOU with the City of San Diego to establish the GSA for the San Pasqual Valley Groundwater Basin to ensure the county would be thoroughly engaged and involved with determining the implementation measures needed to sustainably manage groundwater resources in the basin. The MOU memorialized roles and responsibilities for the county and city to develop the sustainability plan and to ensure a collaborative approach to public participation. The GSA formed a nine-member advisory committee to provide data and policy recommendations for the sustainability plan, and a technical peer review group to review plan components to aid in preparing a scientifically sound and data-driven sustainability plan. The basin is located 25 miles northeast of downtown San Diego within the San Pasqual Valley. San Pasqual Valley is sparsely populated with groundwater primarily used for row crop, orchard, nursery, and dairy operations. Approximately 90% of the basin is city owned and managed as an agricultural preserve with agricultural leaseholds as shown in the hatched area on the map. The San Diego Zoo Safari Park also obtains groundwater from the basin as a city leaseholder. The county's jurisdiction comprises the remaining 10% of the basin as shown in yellow and consists of the San Pasqual Academy, the San Diego River Conservancy, agricultural operations that include Rancho Guijito, three residences, and a few undeveloped parcels. Groundwater use in the county-only jurisdiction is primarily in the eastern portion of the basin. After receiving input from the advisory committee, technical peer review members, and the community, the sustainability plan was made available for a 60-day public review on June 14, 2021. The sustainability plan indicates the basin is currently sustainable, which means there are sufficient groundwater resources to meet current and future needs without causing undesirable results, such as chronic lowering of groundwater levels or degraded water quality. The sustainability plan includes management actions to ensure the basin remains sustainable in perpetuity. Following the 60-day public review, the sustainability plan was finalized in September 2021 and a subsequent stakeholder meeting was held in November to discuss the final plan. The San Diego City Council unanimously adopted the sustainability plan for the San Pasqual Valley Basin on December 14, 2021. Once adopted by the board, the sustainability plan will be submitted to the California Department of Water Resources prior to the January 31st, 2022 Sigma deadline. The sustainability, sustainability plan evaluates basin conditions and includes a network of wells for the GSA to monitor groundwater levels and quality going forward. It includes objectives and thresholds protective of groundwater users, management actions to ensure the ongoing sustainable management of groundwater resources, and a plan for implementation. 
To evaluate basin conditions, a groundwater model was developed to estimate the amount of water that flows in and out of the basin. The model, which considered effects from future climate change, indicates groundwater use is sustainable and will remain sustainable with proper groundwater management. However, changes in crop type or a prolonged drought could impact future basin conditions. 15 years of groundwater data indicate that in portions of the basin, decreased groundwater levels occur during prolonged drought that tend to recover quickly with above average rainfall. The sustainability plan also identifies locations of groundwater dependent plants. Such plants were found in the western portion of the basin where groundwater levels are close to the land surface adjacent to creeks and rivers. In addition, the sustainability plan evaluates water quality to ensure groundwater is of sufficient quality for its intended use. Although data concludes water quality is sustainable, nitrogen fertilizers from decades of farming and dairy operations, along with urban surface water runoff, contribute to elevated nitrate and dissolved solids in groundwater in the western portion of the basin. If extended drought conditions occur, which cause groundwater levels to drop below established thresholds, the GSA would develop a pumping reduction plan to ensure continued operation of wells in the basin. The pumping reduction plan must be approved by the board and city council prior to implementation. Ongoing monitoring will occur in areas with potential groundwater dependent ecosystems. If groundwater levels drop below prescribed thresholds, a study to evaluate the nature, extent, and health of groundwater dependent ecosystems would commence. Additionally, the GSA would coordinate with the city on efforts to remove invasive species as part of their invasive species removal program. <laughs> Several management actions are provided to address water quality related to nitrate and total dissolved solids. The GSA would coordinate and support water quality improvement efforts by the city through its water quality improvement plan for the San Diego River watershed and the Hodges watershed improvement project. The GSA would also conduct outreach and education to provide a forum to discuss evolving water quality issues and options. Consistent with the MOU, the city would hire consultants for implementation of the sustainability plan for the basin and the county would pay its proportional share of 10% of consulting costs. County costs are included in the existing PDS budget. During implementation, the GSA will submit annual groundwater monitoring reports and five-year basin evaluations to the state. The basin is currently sustainable and pumping reductions are not needed. However, if needed in the future, the required curtailment and water use would only be implemented after a pumping reduction plan is developed by the GSA through a public process and adopted by the board and city council. The pumping reduction plan would identify which wells would be subject to reductions and include a timeline to achieve those reductions. Future sustainability plan amendments would also require adoption by the city council and board. During public review, comments on the sustainability plan were primarily focused on concerns over potential future groundwater restrictions, the groundwater model, water quality, and groundwater dependent ecosystems. Comments received from Rancho Guajito about potential groundwater restrictions questioned whether existing water rights would be considered prior to restrictions. The 1959 Trussell Judgment, which partially adjudicated water rights in the basin, arose from the city impounding water with the construction of Sutherland Reservoir without obtaining the necessary water rights. In light of the Trussell Judgment, the city has committed to spending up to $500,000 to evaluate the feasibility and benefits of recharging the basin with water released from Sutherland Reservoir to avoid curtailing water use in the future. Stakeholders have requested this evaluation be transparent, allow for direct engagement from key stakeholders, and focus on the benefits of habitats and environmental conditions. St city staff have agreed to address these concerns while preparing this, this evaluation. In response to comments that question the model's accuracy, the GSA noted that the model would be updated and improved with new data over time. Also, the GSA will base groundwater management decisions on actual measured groundwater levels rather than model results. For comments on potential groundwater dependent ecosystems, the sustainability plan includes a management action to evaluate the nature, extent, and health of groundwater dependent ecosystems in the basin, which may be incorporated into future monitoring plans. 
For concerns raised about water quality, the sustainability plan was revised to include outreach specifically to residential well users on the importance of water quality testing and to discuss potential options and implications of degraded water quality from dissolved solids and nitrate. The county could decide not to adopt the sustainability plan and opt out of being a GSA in the basin by notifying the state. If the county does not adopt the sustainability plan and withdraws as a GSA, the county and other groundwater users in county-only jurisdiction would be subject to groundwater management by the State Water Board. Initially, this would include paying fees and reporting groundwater usage to the state. The state may restrict groundwater pumping in the future. To avoid having groundwater resources managed by the State Water Board, staff is recommending the board adopt the sustainability plan for the San Pasquale Valley Groundwater Basin. This action would maintain our partnership with the city in managing groundwater resources, provide for the county to continue to represent stakeholder interests, and is consistent with the county's goal of being a regional sustainability leader. Staff recommends that the board adopt the sustainability plan, adopt the grant funding resolution, authorize PDS to apply for and accept grant funds to support groundwater management, and negotiate a cost reimbursement agreement with the City of San Diego. In addition to the staff recommendation to adopt the sustainability plan, the board could also direct staff that any future sustainability plan amendment imposing groundwater use reductions should also consider Rancho Guajito's water rights concerns. While the basin is sustainable, groundwater use reductions may be developed in the future if water levels exceed established thresholds in the sustainability plan. At that time, staff would work with the city to consider all water rights in the basin and the prior trestle judgment to develop a pumping reduction plan. The pumping reduction plan would require adoption by the board and city council. Thank you. This concludes our presentation and we are available for questions. All right. Um, I know we, I think we have a presentation and some public speakers. Why don't we do that? And then we'll come back. Uh, when we come back, we'll go to Supervisor Desmond first. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We do have five requests to speak by phone, and that does include one group presentation. I'd also like to note for the record that we did receive one e-comment on this item, and that was in favor. Any members of the public that have requested to speak on this item by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions provided to you. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. You will then have two minutes to address the board. Please begin by stating your name for the record. I'd also like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We will begin with the group presentation. You will have 10 minutes to address the board. All three members of the group must speak during that 10 minutes. Please self-regulate. As a reminder, each person in the group may speak for no more than four minutes. I will unmute all three callers at this time. As I unmute each caller in the group, please state your name before beginning your presentation. Hi, uh, Hank Rupp, Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of Rancho Guajito. Hello, uh, Chairman Fletcher, Vice Chair Vargas, members of the Board of Supervisors. Before I start, uh, uh, first off, I'm here to speak in support of item three, which would address our water rights concerns. But before I start, uh, Chairman Fletcher, I, I have a statement to make, but of course, I wanted to say that I saw the picture of the fire damage to your house in the UT. Uh, I'm very glad you and your family are okay. Thank you so much for your courage and flat out bravery. Uh, thank you for showing up today. Uh, you're a better man than I am. About Rancho Guajito, first a little bit about the ranch. The ranch is a 23,000 acre, 36 square mile grass fed cattle ranch, organic farm and winery. It's the last intact ranch of more than 800 Mexican land grant ranchos, still in private ownership and in agriculture. When you visit the ranch, it's like stepping back in time. We have vast oak forests, which you don't see anymore, vast oak forests that are made up of nearly 300,000 trees. If you, if you line those trees up canopy to canopy, they would stretch all the way to Chicago. So. We're good stewards of the land. We preserve the natural resources and practice sustainable agriculture and ranching, and we welcome the community to visit the ranch through our wine tasting facilities. Rancho Guajito is now the largest organic avocado producer in San Diego County. We are also the largest organic citrus producer in the county, and we have almost 500 acres of Haas avocados, mandarins, those are the cuties, 
lemons, and grapefruit. We're also the largest producer of grass-fed beef, and we will soon be the largest wine producer. And we're doing all of that using only a fraction of the water others would use because we use high-density planting, wherein we plant twice the number of trees per acre while using half the water that others would use. We also use state-of-the-art technology. It allows our trees to text us when they want water, and then they text us again when they've had enough. Uh, as for our beef, after 177 years, we've been done directly and sell, selling directly to consumers. We just received our approved label from the USDA for all natural grass-fed beef. We will soon be the largest high-end beef producer in San Diego County. At the same time, our method of ranching captures far more carbon than anything we emit. We have great interest in the groundwater sustainability plan that you're, you're considering here because water is essential to our operations. It's a fact that Sutherland Dam built by the city in 1954, cut the amount of water flowing into the basin by 50%. Let me say that again, because this is important. When the city built Sutherland Dam, and it would never be able to do that today, the water flowing into the San Pesco Basin was cut in half. The ecosystem of groundwater-dependent plants and animals has never recovered. The basin is what they call stable. The city calls it stable, but that's with their 50% cut. In 1954, that 50% cut caused wells to go dry and led to litigation, which the city lost and was court-ordered to recharge the groundwater when water levels dropped below 20 feet. We do not believe the city has ever followed that court order. Due to those factors, the city has a serious conflict of interest in managing the basin. The development of the groundwater sustainability plan has been a long process, and your county staff with their water expertise made a real difference in fairness for us who are living in the county jurisdiction. I want to thank them very much, Jim Bennett and Leanne Crow. We can now support this plan because the city's agreed to an expanded scope of work for the surface water recharge study and committed to an additional stakeholder engagement. We believe that this study, the, ground, the surface water recharge study, will show that releases of water from Sutherland Dam, as the city was ordered to do by the court decades ago, will make a huge difference for the basin's ecosystem and groundwater levels. I want to thank the county for your leadership in ensuring fair representation for county residences and businesses like ours in the basin, and we request that the county continue to remain engaged in the implementation of this plan and outreach that the city is committed to do. We support the adoption of the groundwater sustainability plan and ask that you consider all water rights in the basin and the significant Trussell's judgment should any pumping reduction plan ever be considered. Thank you. Good morning. This is Lonnie Lutar. Good morning. This is Lonnie Lutar with Responsible Solutions on behalf of Rancho Guajito. While there is natural tension with the City of San Diego, the enhanced transparency and stakeholder engagement opportunities that have been agreed upon in recent months should be extremely beneficial to all. We are very grateful that Endangered Habitats League and the Nature Conservancy are taking the time to monitor this progress and will be engaged as the surface water recharge study moves forward. We look forward to working with the environmental community and all stakeholders in the basin as the GSP is implemented. As noted by Mr. Rupp, we are supportive of adoption of the GSP. While a pumping reduction plan is not currently needed, should one need to be developed down the line, it would be appropriate to recognize the implications of the Trussell judgment and all water rights in the basin. Thank you. Thank you. We can Good morning. Hear. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. This is Ricky Schroeder, RMA consultant. Uh, I was a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee for uh, this effort, uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of Rancho Guajito. Uh, I'd like to thank staff, Jim Bennett and Leanne Crow, for the expertise and professionalism they brought to this very complex issue. Uh, more than once, it was their very down-to-earth explanations that made some of this clear. I'd like to ask board members to continue to provide resources through the budget process in order to allow staff to continue to represent the county's best interest. Thank you. Thank you. We will hear from the next callers.
We will now turn. Uh, we will now turn to the, the the callers. You will be unmuted, and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. You will have two minutes to address the board. Please begin by stating your name for the record. I'd also like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We will begin with our first caller. Good morning, board. This is Kathleen Lippett. I would like to congratulate the county for supporting this groundwater sustainability program. I'd like to suggest that it is a program that deserves to be generalized to the entire county. And in, along those lines, it is important to recognize the drainage that is that it will be occurring from marijuana grows and, and hemp grows because those are not sustainable and they do use, they divert groundwater that is necessary. They should have been restricted to municipal water only as the planning commission suggested. And I hope that you would reconsider that and reconsider this plan for the entire county. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. We will hear from our, from our next caller. Audra again. Hey guys. So yeah, um, you know there's unlimited water, right? That we're not like ever going to run out. It's called geo water. It's actually in the earth. And you guys want to act like, oh my gosh, there's a water shortage. We're in a drought. Oh my gosh, all of these things. We better be afraid and we need to do something about it. Like the boogeyman. But yet there's unlimited water. And so you're going to test, I mean, you're testing our feces. So now you want to test the groundwater. What else are you going to do? Um, are you putting graphene in the water? Is it so that you can, you know, have all the land in the water and so that you guys can control all those things? I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Um, yeah. And so I was just going to say, Nathan, about your fire. Did you have cameras at your house? Perhaps you would look to see what happened, or did you start it yourself? Who knows? Bye. Chair Fletcher, that concludes public testimony on this item. Thanks. Let's go to Supervisor Desmond. T's cross and I's dotted. So I really appreciate their efforts in, in their educating uh, the uh, community out, uh, out there. So. I'm in favor of adopting the plan. I do think we need to be have a seat at the table, but but I really want to ensure first and foremost that the ground use water users in the unincorporated uh, portion of the basin are treated fairly, especially when faced with potential future pumping restrictions if the basin were to become unsustainable. And in particular, as Mr. Rupp had pointed out, I'm concerned that the city of San Diego has not lived up to the obligations that, uh, based on the Trussell judgment to release water from the Sutherland Dam whenever the water got below 20 feet below the surface of the, of the uh, basin. And it, it's now between 20 to 80 uh, feet below that water level. So um, the city of San Diego has not lived up to their obligation. And instead, what they did is they bought about 90% of the land within the basin uh, and so there would be, I guess, fewer complaints or whatever, but uh, they have not done the water releases that they have been required to, to do. So in order to restrict the water use in the future, uh, to, in order to avoid having to restrict water use in the future, particularly to the unincorporated uh, residents of the basin, I understand the city has committed a half a million dollars to do a feasibility study to analyze whether they could release uh, Sutherland Dam uh, water to recharge the basin. I have a hunch they're going to come back with, you know, no, we can't, re you know, use that water because it's either, you know, San Diego County Water Authority water or it's not, or, or uh, they just can't release release it. I'm, I'm afraid their study is going to come back uh, with an unfortunate to cause to where if there's future water shortages that the uh, the unincorporated area residents would bear some of that burden when they the city hasn't lived up to that obligation. So it's my position that the Trussell judgment still stands and should be evaluated prior to any restrictions being placed on groundwater use in the future. 
So particularly for the unincorporated area who use who occupy about 90%, I'm sorry, 10% of the overall basin. So I'd like to go ahead and, and make a motion on this one uh, with the, um, there's a worksheet on this one as well. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and I'll, I'll approve item one and I'll come back to two. Item one, three, four, five, six, and seven. And on two, uh, under the groundwater sustainability plan, um, I'd like to uh, use option or approve option 2B and, uh, I, and include language to option 2B, which mentions uh, Rancho Wajito, but I'd like to include language that includes all of the uh, unincorporated area uh, pumpers in the uh, uh, basin. So I give the language to Andrew already or my staff did, and he should have that. And so what I'd like to add to option 2B is to um, just add to it uh, that direct staff that any future sustainability plan amendment imposing groundwater use reductions should also evaluate prior water right adjudications and consider groundwater rights of the county of San Diego and any other groundwater right holders within the unincorporated area of the county. So basically, I'm just expanding to, yep. be, to from Rancho Wajita to all the, unincorp to, to the unincorporated to pumpers within the basin, actually throughout the unincorporated area. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. I'm happy to second that motion. Um, let me ask the clerk if, if possible, if we can pull up the language for uh, the revised language for 2B and uh, share it on the screen just so we're all clear. Yes, uh, Sheriff exactly. Fletcher, I can do that. Just give me one one minute. Perfect. I'm sorry, that wasn't Andrew, but I, it's all right. <laughs> it's good. Okay, so we've got, a, we've got a motion. Supervisor Jesmond, that reflects your intent? Yeah, but that actually, I think that's 2A with that language. Okay, I get, okay, so that is gonna be added to 2B. Okay, I apologize. That's gonna be added to 2B, thank you. Yeah, and I think you wanted to, Supervisor, I think you just wanted to strike Rancho Guajito because it's it's basically just all groundwater rights holders, right? So evaluate prior um, water adjudication um, and consider groundwater rights of the County of San Diego and any other groundwater rights holders within the unincorporated area. That's true, yeah. So we could either leave Rancho Ojito in or, or just use this language. If we leave Rancho Ojito in, then this new language that just came up there should be. Are. There we are, is that correct, Supervisor? Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically my motion to leave Rancho Ojito in there and this other that encompasses all the all uh, everyone within the base. We can go either way on it. I don't, we can use that's the fine. I, I think that way it's written right there is good if that's good with you, Supervisor. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, let me ask my uh, my colleagues if we have any other comments uh, on this issue. All right, not seeing anyone, any, uh, we heard from our public speakers on this. We have a motion by Supervisor Desmond and myself to adopt recommendations one, three, four, five, six, seven, and then a uh, amended 2B, uh, which was shared on the screen. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional uh, comments or questions. Uh, may I ask the clerk to please call the roll? Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye, and thank you. Not a problem. Uh, Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present, voting aye. All right, our final agenda item today is our sanitation uh, district item number one. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. A second by Vice Chair Vargas. Let me ask the clerk if there's any public speakers in this item. Chair Fletcher, we do not have any public speakers on this item. 
All right. Uh, not seeing any requests to speak on this item. Let me ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Supervisor Anderson? Aye. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Aye. Supervisor Desmond? Aye. Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, aye. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, aye. That motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. There's a business uh, on the agenda before us. Uh, we have one adjournment in memory uh, by Supervisor Anderson in remembrance of Jim Furby. Am I good to go? You are good. Thank you. It's with great sadness that we announce the death of James Ross Furby, who passed away on July 20th, 2021, at the age of 85. Jim was born in Brush, Colorado, with his brother and four sisters. When Jim was six months old, his mom and dad, Marie and, and Ross Furby, drove their Model T pickup truck from Brush, Colorado to Portland, Oregon, Oregon, working as migrant farm workers to support their family. They eventually ended up buying a 10-acre farm near Hillsboro, Oregon. Jim never forgot his humble beginnings. In 1954, he graduated from high school, then enrolled in Portland State College, and later transferred for, to Oregon State University, where he graduated as a civil engineer in 1959. After graduating from OSU, Jim joined the Oregon National Guard Army Aviation Group, where he was an air traffic controller. After active duty, he began his career in waterfront construction, working for Chadwick and Buchanan out of Long Beach, California. His first project was the Bonneville Dam on the Columbia River. Jim also managed local high profile projects, including the construction of SeaWorld in 1963 and the 24th Street Marine Terminal in National City. In 1967, Jim left Chadwick and Buchanan and started Furby Construction Company uh, performing several projects in the Southern California until 1970, when he merged with Bob Zinser and created Zinser Furby, Inc. Jim led constructing many notable projects here in San Diego, including National Steel and Shipbuilding Company Shipyard, Pier 2 Na uh, Navy Base, San Diego, UCSD Nimitz Pier, and the Tuna Boat Pier and Fishing Pier at Seaport Village. Jim was also instrumental in a startup of Marathon Construction Corporation in 1981. Jim's passion and vision wasn't just for construction, but also for business, as he demonstrated when he vertically integrated all of their business operation. Another passion of Jim's was his farm in Forest Hills, Oregon, where he owned and farmed over 800 acres of farmland, including a vineyard that provides grapes to King estate winery. Jim was active in the Association of General Contractors here in San Diego as a member in, in the early 1970s and served on the board of directors in the 80s and 90s. He also played a big role in AGC San Diego's new facility in Lakeside, bringing the association to East County, the heartland of San Diego's construction industry. Jim worked with the county for 30 years on the U.S. Strip, Upper San Diego River Improvement Project by removing the blight, enhancing the environment with significant upgrades, including a 40-acre environmental rest restoration of the San Diego River. He planted over 22,000 trees, uh, multiple public improvements, including 20 million in flood control along the San Diego River, several roads and public improvements, including one and a half acres of hiking, biking, and horse trails. Additionally, uh, he created over 1,200 new infill jobs with 54 small business tenants, which helped fulfill the U.S. DRIP uh, mission. Jim was married to his lovely wife, Joy, for over 50 years. Uh, they enjoyed traveling, and they traveled all corners of the world. Uh, Jim's favorite line was, uh, Joy is the love of my life. Jim is survived by his wife, Joy, his son, Mike Furby, his daughter-in-law, Julie Furby, uh, his daughter, uh, Nicole Badamo, and his son-in-law, Tony Greenwell, as well as his grandchildren, Sean, Camille, Blake, Furby, 
in Brandon Shane Madison Mitchell. He was loved and cherished by many people in East County, and we are sure to miss his visionary leadership here in San Diego. East, East County mourns his loss, and we have all lost a good friend. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor, and our condolences to the Furby family. Uh, that concludes the business on the agenda. I believe we have a few remaining uh, non-agendized public speakers. I'll ask the clerk to call those forward at this time. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We do have three, three more requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda. For those that requested to speak, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I would like to remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll begin with our first caller. Again, please state your name before beginning your comments. Good morning, my name is Kelly McCormick. I'm a public health educator with experience in tobacco prevention education. I would like to address the county's priorities with regard to economic development, worker protections, and the environment. Previously, the question of marijuana consumption lounges in the county's unincorporated areas was under consideration. Businesses of this type would drive away families from the areas where they would be located along with others who have valid concerns about drug-impaired driving and public intoxication. On the environmental front, marijuana consumption lounges would roll back smoke-free workplace protections and expose employees to hours of breathing in secondhand marijuana smoke known to be hazardous to health. University of San Francisco researcher Stan Glantz reports that a marijuana joint produces three and a half times more pollution than a Marlboro cigarette. Marijuana smoke contains many of the same cancer-causing substances and toxic chemicals as secondhand tobacco smoke, including three times the amount of ammonia, along with mercury, lead, formaldehyde, benzene, hydrogen cyanide, and more. Marijuana consumption lounges would set back years of gains in employee health protection. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from our next caller. Good morning. Kathleen Lippitt here. I'm here this morning because I believe the issue of economic conflicts of interest that undermine public health, safety, and welfare gravely concerning. This county has gone from leaders in preventing drug abuse to partnering with the marijuana industry. Yesterday, I cited Dr. Bertha Madras, Harvard medical psychobiologist who participates in ISIAC free webinars with experts in medicine to educate the public and each other on the harms associated with today's high-potency marijuana. Dr. Madras always begins her research information with a statement, I have no conflicts of interest. I wonder if all of you on this board can say the same. The county has an office of ethics and compliance that is dedicated to assisting and fulfilling the county's commitment to the highest standards of ethics and compliance. The public deserves to hear your responses to questions regarding conflicts of interest in relation to your relationship with the marijuana industry, especially in light of your marijuana social equity ordinance disingenuously titled do you have any financial interest in any way in this industry have you ever received money or anything of value from anyone involved in this industry when is the last conversation or communication you've had with those involved in this industry do you have a conflict or interest in any appearance of a conflict of interest when it comes to this industry the public deserves to hear your responses to these questions. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Chair Fletcher, that concludes, public, concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. All right. Uh, that concludes the uh, business before the board today. Thank you all. With that, we stand adjourned. The next regular meeting of the board will take place on Tuesday, January 25th, 2022 at 9 a.m.